LSU soccer icon Mo Isom became the team's starting goalie as a freshman and never looked back. All through her time at LSU, she was celebrated for her skills and became the first female athlete to try out for the men's football team and in 2011 was named homecoming queen. On the outside, Mo appeared to have it all, but on the inside, she wrestled with a poor self-image. In my brokenness, the storms were all I could really see. I struggled with an eating disorder. Suicide was a part of my story. Horrific car accident. In her book, Wreck My Life, she tells the story of her journey from being broken to becoming bold and where she found her true self-worth. Oh, Mo is with us now. And Mo, I've got to tell you, you're a, you're a gamer. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm picking a team, you're number one. Thank you. I mean, that, yeah. I play on your team any day. That's great. <laughs> That's an honor. <laughs> um, uh, just an incredible story. And let, let's just pick it up right where you got wrecked. Mm -hmm. And here you are upside down in a Jeep, and suddenly the presence of God invades. And overwhelmed and filled a gaping hole in my heart. It had been um, years of just a lot of adversity underneath the surface, all of these athletic successes, all of these incredible highs, but underneath dealing with just crippling adversity, um, eating disorder, the suicide of my dad, um, depression, anxiety, promiscuity, I mean, just lost. And what, was a lot of the sports, was that trying to make up for that? You know, I think in a way it was, it was kind of my only therapeutic release. It was my place to go that I could disconnect from what life really was and what was going on and just kind of let it all out. Um, so I think that's really why I continued to excel athletically, even though things were crumbling um, personally, but mm -hmm. it was a place that I was able to um, just kind of be and, and disconnect and compete. Um, so, so that was wonderful and that was a release, but I was struggling in, in a real, real way um, in my heart. And the car accident that night when my prayer had been, God just wreck my life, just end it. Um, you ever want to take that prayer back? <laughs> never, never. Really? I pray that it becomes the prayer of everyone, that they would say, God, do what you have to do to save my eternal story. It's bold. It's kind of scary. And in my life, he answered quite literally. I don't yeah, pray everyone gets in a car accident. <laughs> I don't pray that. But um, no, I think when we have the courage to say, God, break whatever it is that needs to be broken so that I can look more like you, then we've prayed a really strong prayer. And in yeah. my life, he answered and, and a real car accident happened and he really met me in that place. You, you had a list there. You just reeled off a whole list of things. <laughs> um, you knew your life was out of control. Mm -hmm. you, you knew that you needed help. Mm -hmm. But looking at that list, I'd have to say the, the real signature one is the death of your father. Mm -hmm. that, that had to be the source, then everything else flowed from that. Right. It seemed that all the other adversity um, was kind of self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. um, but the loss of my dad was truly something I had no control over. Um, and it was the most impactful to my heart. I mean, he's my earthly father. And at that time, I didn't know the love of a heavenly father. I only knew the picture of love painted by this man. And when this man gave up, um, put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger, I suddenly began to question everything in my own life. How was my love not enough for him to change mm -hmm. his decision that day? You know, we start, um, we turn inward. It, we really do, and um, sin kind of flows out of that. Did you see it coming? Not at all, not at all. My dad was a family man through and through. Um, you know, he, he probably some of his work associates could have seen that he was struggling. Um, he carried a lot of weight. He was an attorney. That's a hard position. Um, but we never saw that. He was mm. his best when he was around his family because that was um, his, his joy. But there were a lot of financial issues that came to the surface. And I think he realized he had, had harmed and, and um, really affected the one thing he loved the most, which was his family. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. You ever ask God why? I did for a while. I sure did. That's really what catapulted me into my depression, into the anxiety, into the promiscuity, into all of the broken things. Um, was wondering how a God who was supposed to be good and loving and um, holy and in control could allow such 
tragedy to happen. And in my life, I wasn't supposed to be that girl. You know, that wasn't supposed to be my story. That's kind of what we all think. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just angry. I was angry with God. And, you know, I say I took off running from him, but it was more of like a wrestling match with him because there was a part of me that knew he was real, but there was a bigger part of me that um, wanted to deny it, you know, wanted to uh, sort of dismiss it because I didn't feel like this God knew me or loved me or even cared that much about me. If he's real, he's not doing a good job of running the universe. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. He's he must, uh, yeah, he, he must be more out of control than uh, right, these other Christians think. You. Yeah. All those those questions got answered though they in did. the records of a, of a Jeep. It was amazing. It was amazing. I think we think we have to um, go through all of this education and, and all of this understanding to be able to wrap our heads around the gospel. But the truth of the matter is it takes a whisper from the king of all kings to your heart. And that education is amazing. But uh, what's you got essential, more than a whisper. I got a, a scream. I got an <laughs> encounter. It was hanging upside down in that wreckage that the Holy Spirit entered that vehicle and it was crushing, it was overwhelming. But this hole in my heart, this gaping hole that had been left after the loss of my dad was filled. And God began to just pour into my heart, be still, know that I am God, that I love you, that I see you, that I know you, I am for you. Satan is waging battles, but I have won the war and I have plans for you and purpose for you. And he just began to download the depths of what Christ crucifixion on the cross actually meant in my life. It was no longer a removed story I had heard in church. It was written into my genealogy. That was a part of my story, this, this sacrifice made on my behalf. I get goosebumps talking about it now. I'll start preaching. I'm, I'm about to go. <laughs> um, it was just amazing. It was amazing. I mean, it, the it the amazing moment. revelation when you, when you agree with the psalmist in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. Mm -hmm. That and it's not incredible. somebody else. Right. These things are here written for me. Right. And it becomes very personal for, for you. It does. And it answers all those questions. It answers all that anger you have about what you're going through, where you, you understand him. What would you say to people who are watching right now that haven't had that encounter and are going, can this be real? Mm -hmm. Can it happen to me? Uh, what do I need to do to get that? Right, that's amazing, because that is exactly where I was for so long. Um, and this is hard and this is challenging, but I would encourage them to pray, God, reveal yourself to me, whatever it takes, whatever you have to do in my life, would you reveal yourself to me um, so that I can't miss it? That's, it's, it's the boldest prayer we can pray, but um, I was a stubborn heart who needed to pray just that, and he responds. I really believe that's a prayer that he very quickly responds to. So to pray that prayer and to begin to open our eyes and our heart to the ways that he may be very much revealing himself, it can transform our lives. It's a scary prayer. It's a bold prayer. It's one we may even pray with even some doubt in our mind. Can he even do it? I, I don't even know. Are these just words? But I challenge you to pray it um, and to see what he does and how he shows up. And that's going to be unique in every person's life. Um, but it's worth asking for. When, when you were rescued in, in the wreckage, you kept telling this retired paramedic, God is beautiful. God yes. Is, did, have you ever talked to him afterwards? That's what I hear. I was saying my mom got to speak to him after the wreck. Uh -huh. I was very much, um, I had had some, some contusions to my brain. I was kind of in and out of consciousness. I don't remember much of him. But he told my mom, I just kept repeating, God is beautiful. And it looked like I had seen the most overwhelming sight. And all I cared to do was tell anyone who would listen about it. And I never got the opportunity to speak to him afterwards. But all I've cared to do since I climbed out of that car is tell anyone who would listen about this king who, who met me and saved me and healed me. And... Um, that's, uh, I'd love to meet him someday. Uh, who knows where he is? <laughs> I, yeah, it was probably the story he can tell at uh, family gatherings yeah. of the weird girl. After, <laughs> yeah, he, he, gets a life, he gets a life story. Um, after this encounter, things weren't all great. And I think a lot of people need to understand after mm -hmm. you have that encounter, that's actually where the real tests really start. Yes. I mean, yes, there's struggles before, but now you're into, you know, right, and you don't have excuses anymore, right, and you've got to do something about you, right, 
you have to change your heart. You have to, you have to go along with this process now. Exactly. What, what was it like for you? So for me, and I think so many people wrestle with this same thing, my heart had been transformed, but I was under the impression I could just kind of step back into the life I had been living and um, that I could just go about my days just as I was, you know, and sort of modify some behaviors maybe. Um, but I kind of just stepped right back into the rhythm of my previous sin. And those temptations that existed before were still very much present. And those people who were in my life at that time and probably weren't the people I should have been with or around, they were still present. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize as I stumbled and struggled in this early walk that God was calling me to die to self, mm -hmm. to step away from, from the rhythm of my sin, from the people, from the places, from all of these things to step into a season of me and God and to begin to learn what a living, breathing relationship with Jesus looks like and means and how it transforms your life, not just modifies your behaviors, but transforms your heart and your life. Um, and so I had to make some really hard decisions. I had to step really into a season of loneliness to say goodbye to people, to disconnect myself from social groups, from places that were comfortable to me, um, and to start to say, God, what would you have for me and where would you have me go? And I think that can be really hard for a new believer because that could mean breaking up with the boyfriend or the girlfriend that you're with. That could mean stepping away from friendships that you've been in for a long time. Um, but there's no more important relationship than your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I write in my book, I kind of loved this line, um, how can we ever uh, be faithful and, and monogamous with a king when we cave to every whim of an adulterous heart? Mm. We sort of have hearts that wander and seek and need prone love and wander. affirmation. We're prone to wander. And God says, love me with all your heart, your mind, your strength, first and foremost and then let life happen, you know, then I'll send you out. So I had to learn that and that was hard. That was really hard, but I stepped into a season of, of you know, isolation with Jesus in a sense, um, relationally, um, especially when it came to relationships with men, I stepped into an intimacy fast that I called Kissless Till Next Christmas. And I write about that in the book. And it was so amazing to be single and in love with Jesus that it actually lasted two years. <laughs> I went far beyond <laughs> Christmas, um, but it was amazing. He began to transform my life and all the people around me in my life. Um, and I was able to see him on a regular basis through the people I was now mm -hmm. spending time with and the community that I was with. And you learned to trust him. Yes, every single day yeah. to make him Lord to make him first, that he would guide my days and my steps, to surrender to that. And, and when we do and we can, it's hard and it's uncomfortable, and then it becomes glory and it becomes amazing. And we, be, we begin to crave it and follow him faithfully um, because there's no sweeter taste. You go back to those old sin, sin struggles and they're just bland, they're yeah. just generic they and artificial. Anymore. They don't yeah. do it. They, they, don't, they don't give the high anymore. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What's next for you? Oh, well, I'm a mama and a wife, um, and I am a speaker as well. I travel the country and internationally speaking, just sharing this testimony, this truth. Um, so now with the book out, it's amazing to have a resource uh, that I can offer, mm -hmm. but um, I just continue to be about his business. Wherever he sends, I will follow um, and go, and I'm excited. Yay. Well, if you want to hear more of Mo's story, all you have to do is pick up a copy of her book. It's called Wreck My Life, and that is a great prayer. It's available wherever books are sold. And Mo, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.